All right, we are looking at China. Former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping earlier today, just one day after presidential climate envoy John Kerry wrapped up his Beijing trip to restart the climate talks. Kerry, who also previously served as Secretary of State, did not meet with Xi during his visit. He failed to make any significant climate agreements with senior Chinese officials, saying U.S.-Chinese climate relations need more work to be able to complete that task. Joining me right now is Atlas Organization founder and the author of The Decisive Decade, Jonathan and DT Ward back with us. Jonathan, great to see you this morning. Thanks so much for being here. So now you've got a third uh, member of the uh, Biden administration uh, coming back uh, with, uh, with a disappointment. Uh, you, you had Secretary of State Anthony Blinken go while he was getting ready to go. They were spying on the State Department and the Commerce Department, hacking into emails. Then Janet Yellen went. When Janet Yellen went, they leaked out into Chinese press that she ate psychedelic mushrooms. Rooms, uh, mocking her. Uh, she's over there bowing uh, to her counterpart. And then, of course, John Kerry uh, uh, coming out. And as even before he leaves Beijing, uh, the CCP says, we will uh, do our own work on the climate and we're not going to be uh, influenced by others. Jonathan, your reaction. Right. And his counterpart, um, you know, Xi Jinhua was the one who in 2011 said at COP17, we've done what we should do, but you haven't. What right do you have to lecture us? So I think we can all understand that when this group is going over to Beijing, I mean, they're not going to come back with what they intend uh, to, to get. So, so the thaw here that people are trying to achieve, I mean, what we're actually dealing with is not something that lends itself to a thaw. I mean, China still has its grand strategy to surpass us. It's still preparing for war with the United States. So there's a fundamental limit to what can be achieved, however well-intentioned this may be. Um, and then Xi Jinping, of course, says about the climate goals. Uh, this has to be free from outside interference. And right. for those that study modern Chinese history, external interference is one of their biggest um, sort of, uh, you know, concepts, this idea that nobody will tell them what to do. I mean, it's very much at the core of the entire idea of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. So the fact that they believe we're even stepping on those toes is not a good sign. So I think there's just a limit to what can be achieved. I mean, very little, honestly. Uh, dialogue for dialogue's sake may be, um, you know, part of the idea of stabilizing this relationship. But we can't stabilize a relationship with an adversary that's intent on beating us in geopolitical competition. And I think, you know, one day in the future, we're going to be very, very, uh, you know, uh, sad and sort of horrified that we didn't use the time we had um, to uh, take harder, tougher actions. I mean, we're running out of time to actually win this contest. And we're not using it properly. Yeah, and, and we don't see any leadership on pushing back out of this White House. The House Select Committee on China uh, has been talking a lot. They are sending letters to four U.S. venture capital firms. This happened yesterday, including Qualcomm Ventures, the investment arm of the chip company Qualcomm. They're demanding information about the firm's investments in AI, chip makers and quantum computing companies. Also uh, in China, the lawmakers write this, American venture capital and private equity investments in PRC, AI, quantum, and semiconductor companies directly contribute to the PRC's human rights abuses, military modernization expansion of authoritarianism uh, around the globe, and the PRC's uh, overall effort to supplant U.S. technological leadership. Jonathan, I don't see Sequoia uh, on this list in terms of receiving a letter, but this is one of the premier venture capital firms in the U.S. that have put their investors in a whole host of Chinese companies. Uh, your thoughts on what needs to be done here in terms of investing in Chinese companies that are likely tied to the military? Well, look, this is a good start. I mean, the, the companies that they've identified, and I think Qualcomm Ventures is particularly interesting because many of the um, corporate um, investment arms that are looking to improve their own, you know, sort of capabilities in China are going to be tied into the uh, Chinese state. So, you know, the, the uh, congressional committee has, uh, ha understands the fundamental problem here, which is investment into the Chinese technology sector is investment into the party state, into the, um, the Chinese military, into the uh, human rights abuses. I mean, Qualcomm Ventures was involved in MEGV and SenseTime, both of which are um, AI sort of enabled uh, facial recognition companies that are um, pretty deep and direct participants in um, the genocide taking place in Xinjiang and all of those human rights atrocities. So then civil military fusion is the other side of this. And, you know, corporate investment in China, I mean, you have to go pretty far out of your way to, to not be involved in um, the, the sort of uh, real elements of 
the Chinese state and why it's a problem for the United States. So I think it's good for us to focus on technology, but that's still a very limited definition. I mean, when we get into the broader U.S.-China economic contest, um, the real problem is growing the adversary uh, writ large. I mean, we're going to have to go after their broader industrial base, in my opinion. I mean, their ability to uh, build and maintain and service a military. I mean, you look at, for instance, the shipbuilding sector, where U.S. Secretary of the Navy um, del Toro has said that they have 13 shipyards, we have seven, and one of their shipyards can produce more than all of our shipyards together. I mean, these are the sorts of problems we have when you have a country that has double the size of our industrial base. So technology is a nice place to start, but this is a much larger, broader competition, and it also matters, um, you know, national wealth and aggregate GDP. So I think we have to take a much broader view of economic competition here. So even as Congress is starting to find the toolkits, I mean, things like the public pension funds, even the private you know, sort of corporate pension funds. I mean, all of this, um, all the capital that is flowing generally into China through MSCI, through China Air, A shares, through the ACWI. I mean, that's the next target that I think they really need to pay attention to. Mm. Uh, the, the capital markets uh, linkages that are much broader than the tech sector and much broader than individual companies. And in the meantime, I mean, when the Chinese officials say they're going to retaliate against export controls, we know that eventually they're going to hit our companies in the China market. I mean, that's just clear. They've already explained that. I talked about this in the decisive decade. I mean, specific sectors and companies that they've even talked about um, retaliating against. And you've seen this with companies like Micron already. I think they're going to go after other sectors yeah. too. But the U.S.-China commercial relationship is just geopolitically untenable. So they are going to take countermeasures. We're going to have to take you know, tougher measures. And eventually that's what de-risking or decoupling or whatever you want to call it really looks like. It's, it's a reality. It's not a, a theory. Well, we still have not heard any uh, specifics in terms of limitations to investing in Chinese companies from this White House, although there are leaks constantly that they're about to do something. I asked President Trump about it, and Trump boasts about the fact that he was able to tax and tariff China to the tune of $400 billion. He says that was the right approach. But I wonder about limitations in investing in Chinese companies. Here's what President Trump told me on Sunday. Watch this. Would you be prepared to attack the economic relationship that we have with China? For example, the capital markets are wide open for communist China, and unwitting investors are basically funding the expansion of the CCP. Would you put limits in place in terms of what Americans can buy? So I did something better. I did uh, tremendous tariffs. We took in hundreds of billions of dollars, tariffs and taxes. So when China, which was just dumping everything into our country, steel and everything. You know, they were dumping steel at a level that was going to put our steel mills out of business, which is what they wanted. I saved the steel industry. We were dead. And I taxed a 50 percent tax on dumping steel. And then they start sending it through other countries, and we caught them. And they start sending it through Canada. Hmm. Uh, meanwhile, China's ambassador to the U.S. is warning that Beijing does not want a trade or tech war with the United States, but it will respond if the U.S. imposes uh, restrictions on investing in technology. The Biden administration claims it is finalizing an, an executive order that would, quote, screen and possibly prohibit investment in China's semiconductor, quantum computing, and artificial intelligence sectors. Jonathan, I don't know if this actually has teeth. What are your thoughts on uh, what the response should be with regard to investing in these companies? Well, look, that, that's an absolutely necessary and welcome um, moment. I mean, it, it should happen now. I mean, it's something we have to lay the groundwork. I mean, no doubt there will be sort of uh, ways in which people will try to water it down or get around it, but that's still the process. But the issue here is time. I mean, we have to, I think, um, get after the much larger capital flows, which are outside the technology uh, sector. I mean, the SEC was estimating that $400 billion is going into China every couple of years just through um, pension funds and that sort of thing. And if you take that across the alliance system, I mean, it's China's access to capital markets. You know, the fact that their uh, bank bonds are listed in, in our indexes and those same banks are out there funding the Belt and Road, you know, that there are companies um, that are participants in um, you know, the human rights atrocities and in the military that, that are part of iShares and uh, MSCI. I mean, these are the real problems. So, so it's not just the tech sectors. It's not just the technology competition. It's the broader economic contest. And the fact that at the end of the day, if we have a country that's growing at 5 or 6 percent this year, as many investment banks are predicting, and they are our primary geopolitical adversary, I mean, they're growing four times as fast as we are. That is the nature 
of, um, of the contest in a sense. I mean, their ability to surpass us uh, results in a geopolitical and military balance that won't, um, you know, it'll, it'll be a disaster for us, um, mm. you know, still within this decade. I mean, by the end of the 2020s, we're going to have a rival that has grown so substantially if we don't take action on capital markets uh, in addition to technology and trade. So it's yeah. those three elements, capital markets, uh, technology and trade. If you do all of that, if you do real economic containment of China, um, then we have a chance to use this decade to win this long-term contest. Mm. But if we don't do that, we're going to see a breakout capacity uh, that will astonish us. Yeah, as you write about in the decisive decade. Jonathan, good to see you this morning. Thanks very much. Jonathan Ward joining us on the threat Thank of you. communist China.